So uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, we went through this little blip on the radar called the dot-com bubble. Some of you are old enough to remember that. Some of you weren't even born yet. Some of you are too young to realize what was going on. But it was an interesting time in which people were figuring out how to make money on the internet. And so you had all these really strange upstart companies that brought about new possibilities. You could go online and book a hotel, and that was amazing, right? You could rent a car online. We, we used to have these things around town called bookstores. How many of you are, are old enough to remember the thing called the bookstore, right? But there was this company, this new company online. It was just a bookstore called Amazon. You ever heard of that, right? That's kind of the way it started. It, you, you would pull up a page like Yahoo or AOL, and it would tell you what the weather was. It would tell you what your favorite sports team did. There were blinking things and all kinds of stuff on there. And, and then like right in the middle of the page and little bitty, you could search for things on the internet. And so there's just a lot of things going on those pages. And then this remarkable new thing came online. It was just a, a white page. And all it was was a search engine called Google, right? And people were asking questions like, have you ever Googled anything, right? That, that was kind of the time we were living in. You would go on a trip, and you would print your directions for the trip. People now are freaked out by driving around with a cell phone in your hand. Man, hey, this is the way it used to be. Well, babe, I got three pages of directions here, right? I don't know where you think you're going, but MapQuest says, right? That, that was the late 90s and the early 2000s, right? And there was also another new thing that, that opened up possibilities, and that was online trading. You, you no longer needed a stockbroker. You could, even if you had a couple of hundred dollars, you could go on there yourself, do your own research, pick any kind of stock you wanted to buy, and, and you could get in on all these new upstart online companies. And people were becoming millionaires overnight. I, I knew people who couldn't afford an aluminum fishing boat who two weeks later were buying yachts in the Florida Keys. I mean, that was, it was amazing. And so it really interested me. So we kind of got in on the thing and, and we had a few hundred dollars and, and I bought stock in this new company for about $6 a share called Priceline, right? And back then, Priceline, you could go in and bid for a hotel room, right? You could you could go on there and say, I only want, I'm going to this city and I only want to pay $45 for a hotel. Give it a second and bam, you got a hotel for like $44.99. Now you'd have to get to know the other family that was staying in the room with you, but it was awesome, right? It was, it, it was really cool, right? But that's kind of the way it started. And so I bought that stock and the reason they call it a dot-com bubble is because it inflated and deflated. It didn't really deflate. It burst. By the time 9-11 happened in 2001, I mean, it, it just, the dot-com economy, those companies found their real value. And man, all that inflate, hey, all those people that bought yachts in the Florida Keys lost their shirts, right, it, by 2002. And so that stock that we bought called Priceline, it really didn't do anything. And so we kind of lost interest in it and we sold it and, and just really made our money back, really. So we just kind of forgot about it for years. Well, now you've got Robin Hood and you've got Acorns. And so over the last couple of years, this kind of renewed my interest in it. And so we've got some money invested in some things. And so Shannon and I were sitting there watching TV the other night and and I looked at her and I said, I wonder whatever happened to that Priceline stock. And I looked it up. And I went, whew, whew. <laughs> and I looked at Shannon and I said, oh, you're going to think this is funny. I said, we had 100 shares of Priceline, y'all, 100 shares. I said, 
Priceline is worth $3,500 today, man. Woo. <laughs> and she goes, we could have paid off the house, right? And she hadn't talked to me since. Right? <laughs> that's, that's kind of where we were. Y'all, had I, for the last 24 years, if I'd have kept that stock, it would now be worth $350,000. But I was brilliant and I sold it when I had the opportunity, right? And, and here's the thing, you know, I, if I'd have known what it was going to be worth, it, this is when Morgan was born, this is the year 2000, I mean, we were raising a baby, we didn't have a whole lot of money, but I want to tell you, if I'd have known that stock would be worth $3,500 today, we would have sold the house and I'd have raised my first child in a pop-up camper. I mean, that's that's what I, you know what I'm saying? I'd have delivered pizzas. I'd have done anything else I could have done to get as much money as I could have possibly scraped together and buy as much of that $6 stock as I could, knowing that I would be insanely rich in this moment. Wouldn't you? I think if we'd all known back then what it would be worth, you would, you would have, man, you would have leveraged everything to try to get in on that investment. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that. When a person looks at the kingdom of heaven, right now it doesn't look like it's going to be worth much. But when a person looks at the kingdom of heaven and realizes what it is going to become, they leverage everything for it. He tells two parables in Matthew chapter 13. One, he talks about a, a man who goes into a field and he finds a buried treasure and he realizes, man, if I can buy this field, I get the treasure. So he covers it back up and he goes and he sells all that he has so that he can afford the field. He puts everything on what that worth is going to become. He says there's a man who goes out and he's looking for pearls, but man, he finds this one pearl that is, it is of incalculable worth, and he sells everything he has just so he can get in on that one pearl of the greatest possible worth. And we would all do that with a stock, with an investment. There, there's none of us who in our right mind would say, man, if I know that, that if I get this now, that later it's going to make me insanely rich, it's of incalculable value, I'd gladly give up now so that I could invest in what that's going to become. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that. But not everybody makes that investment. But for some people, that value suddenly strikes them. And they look at their lives and they realize what I think is important what I am holding on to, what I am putting everything into is really worthless in the end. But if I could get in on this kingdom of heaven thing, it would make all the difference in, in my life. And we find a man who did that in Philippians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible open, I want you to look at Philippians chapter 3. And this is a man named Paul who thought he had something that was worth a whole lot in his life, in his religion, who all of a sudden came to a realization that he needed to reevaluate everything. And he lost it for the sake of one thing, and that was to know Christ. And so we heard the passage read just a few moments ago. I want to ask three questions as we go through this this passage and see how Paul revalued things. The first question is this, what did he lose? What did he lose? And if you look at chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and you go down through verses 4 through 7, he mentions a lot of things there, and, and I'll just say this, they are very Jewish religion, and they are very Jewish culture back in Paul's day. But they were very important because notice he uses the words, the things that I thought were gain to me. These things would have been very valuable to him in his religion and in his culture. And they profited him. 
He was zealous in his religion. He had a really good pedigree. I could go through all those things and spell them out, but I'm afraid that I would lose you. And so let's, let's bear it all down to this. What Paul thought he had and the way Paul lived is what every moral, successful, religious person has done for all of time. It doesn't matter what culture it is. It doesn't matter what religion it is. What he did and what he thought was valuable is what every moral, successful, religious person in this room right now thinks is valuable to them. That's what he did. And, and this is what we've always been prone to do. We take what is, what is a value of our culture and we take the values of a religion and we, we mesh them together in a stew so that each flavors the other to the point that they're indistinguishable. And that's what the Jewish religion was in Paul's day. And man, I'll, I'll just use these words. That's kind of what American Christianity is now. We've taken American culture and we've taken an American version of Christianity and we've stirred them together in a stew so that moral, successful, religious people can look at those things and say, I've got something here. I'm doing all right. And, and so if you could pare it down to three things that Paul says are valuable to him, th this is what I would, I, would, I would pare it down to, three words here. Look at verses 4 through 7. Those are all accomplishments, right? So let's call that self-achievement. If you've done some things, if you've been recognized some things, man, Paul says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of zeal, a persecutor of the church. He had a long list of accomplishments. Paul was a man of great self-achievement. And then notice how many times he uses the word confidence. If anyone thought they should have been confident in the flesh, man, I even more, right? He uses that word confidence over and over again, self-confidence. Paul was a very self-confident man. He talks about his confidence in the flesh. And then if you look later on, he talks about a righteousness Verse 9, not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Paul was self-righteous. He felt like he was doing good by God with what he was doing. So we could describe Paul like this. He was self-confident. He had a lot of self-achievement. And he was self-righteous. And he was blessed by God. And if you really pare it down to a lot of people in our culture and in American Christianity... They're looking for those three things. I'm doing all right. My family's all right. We're good people. You look around at other people. I'm not like those people. I mean, dude, I'm here for Easter, right? Right? This is, we're, we're here this morning. And so I want you to think about how we think. It's much of the way Paul thought and the way he thought that he gained. So a lot of people would say, man, look, I've, I've worked hard at what I do. I have I have mastered my skill. I, I have applied myself and I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I'm blessed. I'm driven, right? Self-confidence. Self-achievement. I've accomplished some good things in my life. My family is well. I earn a good living. God, these, these words, God has blessed me. Self-achievement. Self-righteous. Hey, listen, we pray, we we read the Bible some, we're moral, we attend church. I mean, I'm here today, right? I'm not running around like everybody else. We have Bibles. Hey, listen, we believe in God. So did Paul. And, and I would put this out here. I would tell you that Paul believed in God and was more zealous for God than anybody in this room. So if you're going to count the straight up value of it, he had more value in what he believed and the way he did it than anybody here. He said, I more, right? Self-righteous. And that's what we all tend to think. Listen, if, if I'm doing okay and I'm working hard at it and I believe a little bit and I pray a little bit and we're blessed, God must be good with my life. He's blessing me. He's approving me. He's 
He's bringing me along in this. But all of a sudden, something in the middle of all that made Paul realize what I have and what I think is worthless. And so he lost it all. He cashed it in. What was it? He said it was this, to know Christ. Verse 10, to know Christ. He leveraged it all. I counted it all lost for that, to know Christ. And you may be sitting here today and you go, hey, my family is good. My kids are talented. We're accomplished, man. They're doing good in school. They're, they're pretty good ball players, man. We, we got our family kind of together. Let me ask you this question. Do you know Christ? Your kid may be an amazing soccer player. Do they know Christ? Your family may pray a little bit around the table. You may be blessed. You may have all you have. The question is not, are you blessed? The question is, do you know Christ? I've used this example before, but I think it's a pretty good one, so I'm going to pull it out again, right? So I have two daughters. They're amazingly now both in their 20s. It's incredible. So Morgan will be in the the late service today, Kylie is in Cedartown leading worship down there. She'll be home later on. But, but both of my girls, not surprisingly, love Taylor Swift. And I kind of dig her too. I think it's pretty cool, right? Some of, I, there's some of the songs I know, right? I grew up on Taylor Swift just like they did. <laughs> Anybody who's a parent knows how that goes, right? So, I, man, we had the songs rocking in the van back with MapQuest, right? So, so here we go with Taylor Swift. So... When Taylor Swift came to Atlanta, Morgan bought tickets. She gave one to her sister. They took a bunch of buddies, and they all went. And if anybody followed this Taylor Swift thing, Taylor Swift is amazing in that she has this incredible ability to make everybody in the world think they're her best friend. Don't, so, you know, they like wore, it was the eras tour, so they wore different clothes from the different eras. Everybody, like, everybody goes in there dressed up. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing just... Her influence over people because she pulls all of her fans in so close. I mean, she just has this magnetic personality by the way that she does it. And if you were to ask Morgan or Kylie any kind of Taylor Swift question, man, they could answer it for you. They could tell you about every era of her life. They could tell you what she was doing when and how she did it, and why she did this song and what this song means and, and this weird video and that's, the, that's a color in there, and something went by, and this is what it means, Dad, and they were referring to that guy that she did. I mean, man, they know it all, right? They know it all. But here's the thing. You can't know Jesus like people know Taylor Swift. And what I mean by that is you can't know everything about him. Paul is not saying, I know the resurrection story. Paul is saying, I counted it all lost so that I could experience the resurrection power. Paul did not say, I counted it all lost so that I can know more about Jesus. He said, I counted it all lost to know Christ. So my question to you this morning is not are you religious, not are you doing well, not do you feel blessed. My question to you is, do you know Christ? Because when Paul had that awakening moment that it wasn't just being religious, but man, I was missing out on a relationship with this, he lost everything for the sake of knowing Christ. So what did he lose? He lost self-confidence. What did he lose? He lost self-achievement. What did he lose? He lost self-righteousness for the sake of knowing Christ. Number, question number two, how did he lose it? In verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss. And then he goes on, though, and, and later on in that same verse, but he says, For the sake I have suffered the loss of all things. And, and I would put it like this. I think if Paul had said, I count it all as loss, and he would have left it at that, we'd all be good. Because everybody in this room knows 
In the end, you're not taking your house with you, right? In the end, you're not taking your pop-up camper with you, right? In the end, you're not taking your yacht in the Florida Keys with you. No matter how well you've done, we all know, everybody in this room, I don't have to preach this message, you can't take it with you. We all get that. But we like those things, and we enjoy those things through our life. But man, we don't want to make our life about those things. And so we're, we're kind of thinking, I got it, right? I, I've got it. Now, if, if Paul had only said, I count it all as lost, this is what we could all do. We could be content with that by on paper saying, this is not defining my life and it's not important to me. On paper, that's how we count loss. But when he says, I suffer the loss of all things, he takes it to a different level. Because I count it as loss is what you put on paper, but suffering is what you do every day. Suffering is something being ripped away from you. Suffering is something being taken away from you. Suffering is something you lose it and you don't get it back. Suffering means I redefine the way I spend my time. Suffering means I redefine the value of what this really is. Suffering means I've gone through something that has put a mark on my life and now I'm no longer the same. And I think in American Christianity, we do a great job of counting things as lost, right? Well, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an athlete, and then all of a sudden they get saved, and, and now all of a sudden they're a Christian athlete, and they become a better version of that athlete they've ever been before. And so we use that, that platform, and we win the game, and we thank God, and we're like, oh, man, that's it, right? Or we're in business, and we've done okay in business. I don't know we're misguided some things, but if I come to Christ, it'll make me a better version of what I am. Now, the sports and the, the money and the business or whatever, I know that in, it doesn't define my life. But you still spend all your time with that. It still makes all the decisions for you. And it's one thing to count something as a loss. It's another thing to suffer the loss. So, have y'all heard this country singer? I'm not big into the country music, but I looked up this guy because I kind of heard his story. His name's Granger Smith. Y'all heard about this guy? I mean, this guy's like, he's like up and coming. He's doing, he's on tour, right? He's, and his son died. Little three-year-old boy, I think, was the story. He, he tragically drowned and died, and he got through that. I think he has like five children or something like that. And so he announces a couple of weeks ago, hey, listen, he gets on video. I watched the video, and he says, this will be my last tour. He says, the Lord has led me to kind of focus on my church, to submit to my pastor's, for them to disciple me and help me to grow my Christian faith. The dude is enrolled in seminary, and he's going into ministry. He's giving it all up. And you're like, wow. Now, please, un this is where we go sideways on what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that Christian music, country artists, there, there, are, there are country artists who are Christians. I'm not saying that if you don't stop your tour, you must not be a real believer. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what Granger Smith's saying, okay? And listen, I'm not saying you've got to do what Granger Smith did. This is where I want you to lean into the story. Listen, Granger Smith said, the Lord led me to. That guy had a conversation with God. That guy's had a conversation with Christ. He doesn't know Christ like my daughters know Taylor Swift. They talk. And Granger Smith is not saying this is what everybody's got to do, but this is what he's saying. I can't just stand up here and say, I love Christ and this is not ultimate. Actually, Christ called him to give it up. He's losing it because that's what the Lord told him to do. What have you lost for the sake of Christ. And that could go a lot of different ways. Sometimes you lose it because he wants you to count it as loss, which the other side of that means, man, you just say, hey, I don't want you to focus on that. I don't want you to do that anymore. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of my story, but over the last four or five years, 
There's been a lot of things in my life where Christ has said, it's time to stop that because I want you to know me. And even when I was preparing this message the other day, I, I was praying about what this means. And I was looking at, and I'm, I was praying, Lord, this is what I really want to see happen in our church. This is what I really want to see happen in my life. And while I'm having that conversation with Christ, it's almost like he rolls back the tape, right? Just bloop, and, and just kind of shows me some things. And he shows me some things that have always been happening in my ministry that I've never really point, I've never really paid attention. I guess maybe I did, but I just didn't want to admit it. And here's the amazing thing. He even brought back some conversations to my mind of things some people have said to me over the last year. And he's let me know, man, that's, that's me using my people to speak these things into your life. There's some passages of Scripture. That, and, and this is what, I mean, this is really what Jesus told me. Listen, I could give you those things, but it would only foster your sense of self-achievement. It would only foster your misguided self-confidence and it would only foster your self-righteousness. And I want you to know me. And so this, this week, it was on Wednesday afternoon, I had that conversation with Christ. I know him. And I, and I want to let you know this. What he told me stinks. I don't like it. I don't like it. And there's a part of me that, that looking at those things and surrendering to them goes, man, ugh. And here's why. Because I've put a lot of my self-value in those things. And there's a side of my brain that for the rest of my life is always going to be looking at going, hey, you're a failure, dude. You're a failure. You're a failure. But I have to remember that conversation I've had with Christ, the things he's used in my life, the things he said through other people, the passages that afflicted my heart, and, and say, hey, I want you to know me. And the worth of what that's going to become is incalculable. And so, yeah, I'm willing to lose it all for the sake of knowing Christ. Sometimes you count those things as loss, and listen, sometimes you suffer those things as loss, and none of us in this room want to think about a version of Christianity that would call us to any kind of a suffering. But there's some things in your life that will just be ripped away, and I'm telling you, it is horrific to go through. But American Christianity is all about the gain, right? Right? That you come to Christ and you can become a better version of what you are. But my question is, what have you lost? Because when you come into American Christianity based on what you gain, you almost make a deal with God. Listen, I'll worship you. I'll be in church. I'll read the Bible. I'll pray some as long as I don't lose. And here's my question to you. What is it that you can't lose That if you lost it, you'd give up on your faith. And I've seen it happen numerous times. I mean, people who are like blessing their business and are doing well and all this kind of stuff, all of a sudden when life crashes, dude, they quit. And the reason why is because they almost made a deal with God. Listen, if I lose my health, I'm out. If I lose anybody in my family, I'm out. If I lose my business, I'm out. Man, when life gets tough, even though they don't express it like that, what they really did is made a deal that said, hey, I'll love you as long as I don't lose. Right? So what's on that ledger sheet for you? Because here's what you're doing. What you're saying is your stock in that is worth more than Christ ever will be. And Paul said, man, going through the suffering made me to realize, and boy, I, not only did I count it as loss, but I suffered the loss. It made me to realize it wasn't worth hanging on to. And there's so many people in this room who can agree with what I'm about to say because you've been there too. There's some things you only learn about Christ through the suffering of the loss. Because nobody in their right mind would say, yeah, take that away. <laughs> but boy, he does. 
And that's when you'll really learn about him. And so Paul says, not only did I count it as loss, but man, I suffered the loss. And here's my last question. Why did he lose it? He lost it to know Christ. And not to know the Easter story, but to know the power of his resurrection. Wow. Paul did not suffer the loss so that God could use him on a greater platform to do better things for him. He suffered the loss to know Christ. Listen, Paul did not suffer the loss to go to heaven. Paul suffered the loss to know Christ. One of the most sobering passages in Scripture is Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to read it to you real quick. This is Jesus preaches the Beatitudes. He's introducing his kingdom. And he gets right to the end of that in verse 21. Listen to this. Listen, listen to how Jesus sobers us up off of American Christianity and says, let me let you know what this is really all about, right? Listen to this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Not everybody who wins the Super Bowl and thanks God for it. Not everybody who thanks God for their business. Not everybody who is in a solid Christian family, is blessed in their health. That pr- not, everyone who sa- not everybody who attends Easter services will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name. Do many mighty works in your name. That's really impressive. Self-confident, self-achievement, self-righteous. Did we not do many wonderful things in your name? And then I will declare to them, and listen to me, guys. Listen to what he pairs it down to. Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. That's sobering. Because here's what's going to happen today all across this country. I hope it doesn't happen here, right? But all across this country, man, there are so many people in great Easter services today. And and I'll just let you know, when you stand before Jesus one day, he will not ask you, what would you think about the Easter service? He'll ask about whether or not you knew him. Not knew about him, knew him. And so what's going to happen today all across the country are, man, people are going to go into services and hear quality music. I mean, professional grade, really quality music. People are going to go into services today and tweet out statements they heard the pastor say. They will be blown away by how well-crafted that message was. And they'll walk out of there inspired, inspired. Inspired to do more for Christ because of what he has done for me. Self-achievement. Many people leave Easter today believing that because of what Jesus did for them, they can do more for him. Self-confidence. Many people will leave Easter today wanting to be morally better. Self-righteous. question is, do you know Christ? Because listen, he did not die for you and raise from the dead to make you a better version of yourself. He rose from the grave so that we might know him. And it will cost you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me just for a moment? What man among you who doesn't find a treasure hidden in the field would not say, man, I'll 
I'll sell all that I have so I can buy this field. What man among you who's looking for pearls wouldn't sell all that he has to get that one pearl of incalculable worth? Paul recalculated his life and his religion, and he came to the conclusion, what I have is worthless. And y'all, he had something that was real gain to him. It was working. And he said, it's worthless. So my question to you this morning is not, are you religious? Are you accomplished? Are you blessed? The question is, do you know Christ? Because if you don't, it's worthless. You may like Easter, but if you don't know Christ, it's worthless. And so here's what we're going to do. David's going to come up here and he's just going to play for a moment. There's going to be some people who just stand down here. And and if you need to go to one of them and find counsel to help you, with maybe some things you're thinking or going through right now, you you can go to one of them and they'll share the gospel with you. If you just want to come in this altar, man, maybe you are a believer, but you say, man, Lord, I have, I've counted as lost, but I'm really living my life like I value those things above all else. Like I'm not really living it for you. What, what do you want me to lose? What, what is it that I can know you more? Maybe you just want to come and pray about other things this morning. And I want to give you just a moment with a, a verse and a chorus, and I want to pray over all of us, and we'll all dismiss together here in a moment after the baptism. After I pray, those who are going to prepare for baptism can go ahead and go back there and get ready for that. But Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we realize that we have stirred together a stew of culture and religion that is worthless. So Lord, help us to not walk out of here this morning with more self-confidence. Help us to not walk out of here this morning with more self-righteousness or even this morning more determined for more self-achievement. But Lord, help us to walk out of here this morning knowing that it's worth losing it all to know the resurrected Christ. So, Heavenly Father, we pray you would save souls. You would reclaim those that have walked away from you, God. May this be a resurrection day for their dead faith to know Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If the Lord's leading you to come to the altar, you come on right now. Come on.